Acts, the 26th chapter, begins the story of Paul uh, beginning his defense before uh, Agrippa, before Festus, before Felix. We see Paul is imprisoned here in the city of Caesarea. And it's a quite a moving sermon that Paul begins in the 26th chapter of the book of Acts. As he begins to talk about the vision, remember he says, I was not disobedient to this vision. Paul is on his way to Damascus and uh, when he gets knocked off of his horse and he talks about that particular experience and he begins to describe what happened to him and why he was converted to this Christianity, why he's, why he's a converted Jew now, or a completed Jew, or why he's changed his thought, his theology. And so Paul begins his defense. He's imprisoned here in this city, and he begins his defense, and most likely from this stage that's directly behind us, where all the people and all the nobles could come and hear uh, orators and great speeches and the such, and so this would be, of course, probably the most natural place for him to hear uh, to be heard. And so we've got Agrippa in the audience somewhere. I don't know if he's actually sitting in the seat that you're sitting in, probably much more royal box that he's going to be sitting in. But m imagine Paul getting the opportunity because of his words, because of the gospel, he's getting an opportunity not only to preach to Agrippa, not only to preach to the, the Roman nobility or, or the nobility of the area, but filling this, this theater with people that are unsuspecting, not knowing that they're going to hear the gospel not knowing that this defense, uh, this trial that's going to go on, they're going to get the gospel message. They're going to church. They don't know it. They think they're going to a theater and hear a great orator but, or to hear the defense, but they're going to end up in church. And he begins to preach. And by the time we get to the 24th verse of chapter 26, and as he thus spoke for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you're beside yourself. Much learning doth make you mad. But he said, I'm not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of of truth and soberness. For the king knows of these things before whom I also speak freely. For I'm persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him for nothing was done in a corner. King Agrippa, you believe the prophets. I know you believe. He's really putting Agrippa on. He's really putting it to Agrippa. You can't deny this. I know that you know the prophets. You know the word of God. You know the Bible. You know the prophecy. So you can't get around this thing. Now Festus here, he doesn't know these things, but Herod Agrippa, you know these things and you believe in the prophets. I know you do. And you know that what I'm speaking about and about the coming of the Messiah, this is what Paul is preaching. The word says, then Agrippa said unto Paul, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And Paul said, I would to God that not only thou, but also all that hear me this day were both almost and altogether such as I am, except these bonds. And when he had thus spoken, the king rose up and the governor and Bernice and they that sat with him. And they were gone, and, and, they, and they, well, they, they leave the theater, the word of God says, and they, they, they leave the place and said that if this man had not appealed to Caesar, he could have been set free. And I'm thinking about not only Agrippa, Almost you persuade me to be Christian. I'm thinking about the seed of the gospel that went into unsuspecting ears, much like when people just attend a church service, not just this, they're, <clears throat> they're going to church not knowing, and they hear that seed, the seed of the word of God. And Agrippa gets up and he says, boy, you almost did it to me. How many times have we been in church and seen people almost ready to come to the altar, almost ready, they're, 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 they raise their hands, I want to accept Jesus, but they don't. They, they, they're so convicted because the gospel is a convicting message. The, the, the word of God is, a, it, it, it is an incorruptible seed and it goes in and almost, almost they get ready to make the decision. What holds them back? I don't know. I think there have been many studies about it and there'll still be many more. Why men and women will come to that point where the convicting power of the Holy Spirit will speak to them and they're about ready to make a decision. Maybe Agrippa doesn't make the decision there publicly because, well, you know, there's a lot of people around and, you know, pride does go before the fall. And maybe pride freezes people from making decisions for, the, uh, for Christ. But here we see the king in a court of maybe 3,800 people and it comes down to Paul singles out one man and a whole crowd of 3,800 and say, I'm talking to you, boy. I'm talking to you, lady. I'm talking to you about the gospel. It's not what these other 3,800 or 3,799 people are going to do. It's you. What about you? You see, that's what it comes down to. It's not about does your family believe? Uh, are you in a Christian nation? No, it comes down to one-on-one. -on -one. What about you? Do you believe in the gospel? Do you believe in the message of Jesus? And, and one of the saddest things I read in the Bible, there's so many sad accounts 
Agrippa simply gets up and walks out the back door of the church. Does he ever get saved? What happens? But the seed went in. And I am, I am believing since Caesarea is going to become the center of the Christian church, that many of the seeds are planted in that moment when Paul's defense is before Agrippa. Men and women that came to see a drama come to see some sort of courtroom like we see on our TVs today and how many court cases that everybody's interested in. This was a big court case. And come and expecting just to hear something, not knowing. And while they're listening, the seed of the Word of God is going down into them. I want you as family and you that are Christians, you wonder about your family. Are they ever going to come to know the Lord Jesus? Don't forget the Word of God is a seed. It's a living seed and it goes down into us. And it's really hard to dig that thing up. And you just need to trust that your family is going to come to know the Lord. Maybe unsuspecting. These people, 3,800 people, they didn't know what they were going to hear that day. But they were caught in a moment at the crossroad of making a decision. We just need to pray that our family is not one of those people like Agrippa. Well, I almost did it. I came that close into accepting Jesus. I, if that preacher had said one more word, I believe I'd have went to that altar. How many people will stand before the court of God and say, I almost did it. I was that close, God, but I just, something stopped me. Something stopped me. Boy, do we really need to pay attention to our spirit and listen to the Holy Ghost. And when God says and God speaks the word, Paul is not preaching his defense. Know this, he is not preaching his defense. Paul is being an evangelist on a stage to a church of 3,800 people with nobility sitting in the sanctuary. He's preaching the gospel. He's not interested about his defense. He knows, I'm, I'm, I'm headed, I, I, I'm gonna go to Rome. He knows what's gonna happen to him. But he takes the opportunity to preach the gospel. God help us to take an opportunity to preach the gospel every chance we can. Because you see, it's not about us. It's about the message that we hold inside of ourselves. We're vessels of the message of the gospel of Jesus. The word of the Lord says in Zechariah the 14th chapter, Behold, the Lord, day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoils shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought again the day of the battle. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north, and half of it shall move toward the south. Now, this particular event that I'm describing is a description of the second coming of Jesus. Remember, we've had our first coming. He came as a babe in a manger, born in the city of Bethlehem, and uh, lived for 33 years and then paid the price for our salvation upon the cross. He rose again on the third day and he's at the right hand of God the Father. What Jesus does about 40 days after his crucifixion and his resurrection, he spent some time with his disciples, teaching them things, helping them understand more things. The word says they didn't really understand a lot of things until after the resurrection. Well, after 40 days, Jesus leads them up on a mountain, the Mount of Olives, which is directly behind me. You can see the Mount of Olive area and the area of a lot of cemetery. There's a, there's a huge cemetery up on top of the Mount of Olives. You see the Golden Dome. If you go behind the Golden Dome and go straight up, you're up on, there's the Garden of Gethsemane. And then you see the Mount of Olives. Now, according to the Word of God, Jesus, when He returns again on the second coming, He's going to come from the heavens and then He's going to place His feet on the Mount of Olives. This was the last place that He stood on planet Earth prior to the ascension. That's is where he ascended to heaven from on the Mount of Olives. When he comes, half of the mountain is gonna to go toward the north and the other half is gonna to go toward the south. And a great valley is gonna be created here at the Mount of Olives. Now this has already happened once because at one time Mount Scopus, which is off to my, uh, over here to the left, and Mount of Olives was one mountain range, but a great earthquake took place, split the mountain area, and so now we have Mount Scopus and we have the Mount of Olives. So this is gonna happen when Jesus comes, he places his feet on the mountain, it's going to split, and the word says that the river of God is gonna go flow out from underneath Temple Mount. And the Temple Mount is directly under the place where you see the Golden Dome, the Dome of the Rock. 
the water is going to flow out from the temple. Part of it is going to go to the Dead Sea, which is off to this direction. And the other part is going to go toward the Mediterranean Sea, which is behind the camera. And the water, the water is, are going to flow until they come to the Dead Sea. And the Word of God says the waters are going to heal the Dead Sea. This is the time when Jesus is going to establish and set up his millennial kingdom for 1,000 years reigning here on this present earth. And uh, you and I, glory to God, the word says we're going to rule and reign with him because Jude says the Lord comes with 10,000s of his saints. And the word says to execute judgment. So you and I as Christians, we're coming back with Jesus. From this city, he will rule and reign, the city of eternal peace, Jerusalem, the city of the king. You know, in all the places on planet Earth that God, that God could choose, he could choose Chicago, Washington, D.C., he could choose where you live. But God chooses one place, Israel and Jerusalem. He said, this is mine. This is forever mine. And Jerusalem is, a, is going to be the city of the king. It's going to be the city where the real king, the real Christ is going to reign from. No wonder Satan fights for the control of this city. He wants to rule and reign from this city because it's prophesied in the word of God that the real Christ, the real Messiah, is going to rule and reign from this city. But you and I know that Satan will not be successful. Jesus is going to rule and reign from this beautiful city of Jerusalem for a thousand years and going to prove that he is King of kings and Lord of lords. Hallelujah. John says he saw him, his vesture dipped in blood, his name written up on the side, King of kings and Lord of lords, returning soon. Hallelujah. Be ready, child of God, because the word of God says he comes in an hour that you think not. I think one of the most awesome sights that you're able to see when you come to Israel is the site that you're looking at right now behind me. This massive valley called the Valley of Jezreel. I, this valley goes from Mount Carmel and all the way to Mount Tabor, off in the distance to the mountains of uh, Gilboa. This breadbasket of Israel. And uh, it, it's, it's a massive valley, miles and miles wide, many, many miles long. But the importance to the, of this valley to you and I is recorded in the scriptures. In the book of Revelation 16th chapter, the word says, the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Jesus speaking, behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watches and keeps his garments lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And he gathered them together in the place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. I'm standing upon the ancient Tel Megiddo, the chariot city of Solomon, and behind me the valley of Jezreel is the actual place where Antichrist and all of his forces and the forces of the world will gather together in this battle area, this valley area. Napoleon said it was the greatest battlefield in the world. Kings of Israel and Judah have been killed here. Uh, people, have, Great armies have been defeated here in this valley. And the great army that will be defeated is that of the army of the Antichrist. The Word of God tells us on that day, on the last day of the tribulation period, that Jesus will return. The skies will split and everybody will begin to see that it is Him and they, because they've gathered to war against the, Jesus, are gathered to war against Christ. And the Antichrist will be here and the false prophet. All of these people, millions of people, the Word of God says that there will be so much blood that it will be as high as the bridle of a horse in this great valley. This, my friend, is where that great battle between Antichrist and the and the force of, forces of wickedness are going to battle against Christ. Right now you see it here as I'm standing on planet earth, but praise be unto God. The word of Jude tells us that Christ comes with 10,000s of his saints. We as raptured Christians will see this place again, but we'll see it from heaven's eye view as Jesus battles a very quick and very decisive battle with Antichrist and his forces and then set up his millennial kingdom upon this planet for 1,000 years, you are looking at the place, the Valley of Megiddo, the place of the Battle of Armageddon. Isaiah chapter 62. For Zion's sake will I not hold my peace, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest until the righteousness thereof 
go forth as brightness and the salvation thereof as a lamp that burns. And the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness and all kings thy glory. And thou shalt be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord shall name. Thou shalt also be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of thy God. Thou shalt no more be termed forsaken, neither shall thy land any more be termed desolate, but thou shalt be called Hephzibah and the land Beulah, for the Lord delighteth in thee, and thy land shall be married. For as a young man marries a virgin, so shall thy sons marry thee, and as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall thy God rejoice over thee. I have set watchmen upon thy walls, O Jerusalem, which shall never hold their peace day nor night. Ye that make mention of the Lord, keep not silence, and give him no rest, till he establish, until he make Jerusalem a praise in the earth. The Lord hath sworn by his right hand, and by the arm of his strength, surely I will no more give thy corn to meat for thy enemies, and the sons of the stranger shall not drink thy wine for that which thou hast labored. Oh, Jesus, help me get through this. But they that have gathered it shall eat it and praise the Lord. The enemy is not going to take what you planted. It's going to be yours, not only for you, but for the seed of Abraham, the children of Israel. And they that have brought it together shall drink it in the courts of my holiness. Go through, go through the gates, prepare you the way of the people, cast up, cast up the highway, gather out the stones, lift up a standard for the people. Behold, the Lord hath proclaimed unto the end of the world. Say ye to the daughter of Zion, behold, thy salvation comes. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. And they shall call them the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord. And thou shalt be called sought out a city not forsaken as surely as the walls of this city remain as surely as they are standing even prophetically when half of the city be destroyed at the time of the antichrist jesus is going to establish peace on this planet and rule from this marvelous city these walls standing here built yes almost 600 years ago, 500 some years ago. And they, but underneath the walls, underneath the walls, remains of the original walls. You saw the broad wall that Hezekiah built. We're standing in prophetic history. We're not standing in some tourism spot. You're standing on the spot that Jesus has been going to be declared King of Kings and Lord of Lords and rule from this city. And God has set watchmen just like the will sit up on the walls at night to look and see which direction the enemy is coming from. God has set watchmen on the walls of Israel. He's going to continue to overlook this city, overlook this place. God has made a promise. God is a God who does not break promises. The scriptures tell us that all the promises of God are yea and amen. And he's a promise to the Jewish people. If God goes back on his promise to the Jewish people and the original seed of Abraham, you just been grafted in. You're the Netzarim. You're the one, you're the shoot. You've been grafted into the tree. If God forsakes his promise to the Jewish people, you and I don't have a leg to stand on. We can't stand on any promise. Do you understand that? Even salvation, healing, nothing. But as long as this city stands, as long as there are the Jewish people, think about it, child of God, the miraculous people, the Jewish people who have been dispersed, d d d dispersed from this land for 2,000 years. They've come back. Yes. They've got their own language, the Hebrew language as it was. Yes. They've come back. The roots are here. Do you understand that the Jewish yes. people being here is it's also a sign for us that the God of Abraham, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob will keep his promise. If it takes a generation or two or a thousand generations, God is a God of his word. He will keep his promise. So whatever promise you're standing for, whatever promise you're believing God for, 
Do you understand that God is watching over his word? He said, I will not send my word out to it will return to me void. Whatever I send my word out to do, it is going to accomplish the thing that I sent it to do. So whatever the promise is, whatever you're believing for, as surely as you stand on the foundation of walls that have been destroyed and rebuilt, destroyed and rebuilt, destroyed and rebuilt, many times this city destroyed, leveled to the ground, but here it arises again. It's not called Al-Quds that, that, that the Muslims call it. It's not called Chicago or, or Richmond or, or, or New York. It is called Jerusalem, the city of peace. It is the city of the king, not only of King David, but the king of kings himself, Jesus, will rule and reign. The son of David will rule from this spot. Yeah. Thanks be unto God. This is why as we go to the Mount of Olives, we will gather together and we will pray for the peace of Jerusalem. No, I understand about the situations that are going on with the terrorism and the things like that and the, and the fight between the Arabs and the Jews. But you understand that when you and I are praying for the peace of Jerusalem, we're not praying that they just lay down their weapons and stop throwing their bombs. We're praying for the Prince of Peace to return and establish his kingdom here. That's why we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. It even means the city of peace. Hallelujah. Think about it, darlings. It, 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 here in this year, 2006, who would have thought we'd have come this far? But think about it. We may live for a short time and then die. It could happen. But as sure as the sun rose this morning and will set tonight, Jesus is coming back to this spot to rule and reign and you're coming with him. I just want you to know that. You're coming with him to rule and reign not to lord over people, but to be priests, to lead people to Christ, to show them that Jesus is the answer. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank God for the fortification of the city. Jesus. The fortification of the city. <clears throat> God's keeping it. Amen. Hallelujah. Not for the devil. Thank you. you understand why the devil fights for the city so much? Why Satan fights for the city so much? The real Christ, the real Messiah will rule and reign from here. This is why he wants it. The Jewish people teach and believe. I believe it. I believe it. I can't believe that it all started over in Babylon somewhere. I believe it started right here. That man was created from the dust of the earth up on top of Mount Moriah. Amen. It was there that where the Garden of Eden was. It was there where Adam and Eve enjoyed the blessings of the Lord. They were thrown out from the presence of God. They went to the east toward the Mount of Olives. We understand they came. The first city ever established was established east of Jerusalem. What was that city? Jericho, the oldest known city in the world that has built that direction here in the ch my heavens child of God of all the things and the places that we can go this is a living testimony that it started here and it's just coming all the way back around and it's going to end here hallelujah glory to God we're going to be here take your pictures pick your spots out because you're coming back hallelujah Well, I trust that something was sung today or something was said in a teaching or something that just kind of touched your heart. And I pray that God has ministered to you in some supernatural way. We're believing for healing power, that God is going to touch your body. Many of you have called on the prayer lines and are asking for miracles in your life. God still does miracles today. The Word of God teaches us that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today and forever out of Hebrews 13 and 8. So we understand that if we see Jesus doing it in the New Testament, healing and delivering people and setting them free and just changing lives, then he's doing the same thing today. Maybe at some time during the broadcast, you felt the power of God just touch you in a certain way and maybe you're not ready to meet the Lord. Maybe you've never really truly asked Jesus into your heart and life. You can do that right now, my friend, by simply praying a simple prayer and asking Jesus to enter your heart. He is the Son of God. He is the only way to God. I know there's a lot of religions out there that say there's many ways to God. But Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. And no matter what you've done, no matter what kind of life you live, Jesus is ready to change your life. He's ready to forgive you of every wrong thing that you've ever done. But Jesus is a gentleman. He won't force his way in. He comes by invitation. And if you'd like to pray that prayer with me right now, just a simple prayer of asking God in your life, tonight God will begin to turn your life around. You're going to begin to see miracles happen in your life. God can fix every bad situation if you'll just give Jesus your heart. Why don't you pray with me right now? Lord Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe that you were crucified and died for my sins. 
I also believe that you rose from the dead. And because of you, I can be saved. I confess my sins, every wrong thing I've ever done. I confess them all. I blame no one. Come into my life, Lord. Be my Lord and Savior. And I'll live for you forever. I ask this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, if you prayed that simple prayer and meant it, you really believed it in your heart, then something happened. Maybe you didn't feel anything, but something happened. At that moment, God wiped away every stain of sin in your life. And now you're a child of God. And now you need to be a part of the kingdom of God. Yes, you need to be a part of the kingdom of God by joining a church somewhere, going and being a part of a fellowship and finding out what you can do in the kingdom of God because you're on assignment. Jesus is coming again, my friend. Thanks be unto God that you're ready to meet him in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. We're gonna see the return of the Lord. I know you're glad that you're ready. I'd like for you to come and visit with us here at Victory anytime. Come and be with us. We'd love to pray with you. We'd love to just share our heart with you, share Jesus with you. God is awesome this day, and he's changing lives all over this area, and I'm glad that he's changing yours. Thanks be unto God because of what Jesus has done. We can walk in victory every day, and praise God, you're walking in victory now. Now is the ministry broadcast of Victory World Outreach Center in Richmond, Kentucky. If you live or are in the metro area, we invite you to come and worship with us on Sundays at 10.30 a.m., Wednesdays at 7, and Saturdays at 7 p.m. Victory World Outreach Center is just off I-75 at exit 90, going north on US-25 Lexington Road, three-tenths of a mile on your left. To learn more about the ministries and events of Victory World Outreach Center, visit us online at www.vwoc.com. For prayer requests or comments, write to us at Victory World Outreach Center, P.O. Box 826, Richmond, Kentucky, 40476, or by email at info at vwoc.com. It's our prayer that you may know the revelation the Word of God teaches about the power that Jesus has given you to walk in victory in every area of your life.